Okay, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Um, first, uh, before we get started, I just want to spend a second acknowledging the, 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 the moment that we're in here in South Africa and Africa in general. You know, we've all seen instances of uh, uh, violence uh, against women, and uh, while this session is about digital identity, it's also about empowering people and giving people dignity, uh, particularly women. Um, I, I know it's in the room, and I just want to empathize with those who are feeling uh, particularly hurt and vulnerable, uh, and commit all of us to do what we can uh, in our own ways about addressing this problem. So thank you for that. And uh, let's get started with this conversation, which is about the power of digital identity. Uh, my name is Magdi Amin. I'm an investment partner with the Omidyar Network. And we believe in the notion of good digital ID. Uh, we believe digital identity is a very powerful vehicle. We've seen uh, the potential economic benefits um, estimated in the trillions, uh, the kind of efficiency gains that can accrue to countries that pursue digital identity. Uh, everything from financial services to social safety nets to health or to education. Um, in order to get services, you need to be able to identify yourself but it must be good digital identity, identity that protects people, gives people security, uh, and uh, user control, especially given the importance of data to our economies. Uh, we, we have a very, very important panel, uh, and the voices here really help to shed light on this question, and I'd just like to introduce them um, before we get started. So, um, Ms. Paula Ngabere is the Minister of ICT of Rwanda. Uh, Rwanda is uh, a leading light uh, on the continent on how you use ICT. And within Rwanda, Paula is a leading light. Uh, every time I've heard her speak, I'm just impressed by how you can think about user-centric and citizen-centric service delivery and how ICT can use to empower this. I'm very thankful for having Paula on this, on this one. Um, uh, Margaret Fra Franco is the Vice President for Dell, for Europe, Middle East, and Africa. Uh, Dell, we probably all of us have used Dell, but Dell isn't just hardware, it's also software. If you really think about edge, edge computing, uh, traceability of supply chains and services, um, Dell is an important player. We look forward to hearing your views. Thank you. Um, given how we, we uh, are now focused uh, and really aware of the issues around women, the fact uh, that uh, Ms. Jop is here is uh, I think a very wonderful sort of testament to how we need to put women at the center of this agenda. Uh, so Benetta is the heads, heads uh, uh, Femme uh, Africa Solidarité, and she's very much concerned about the role of uh, refugees and women in, in identity as well. <clears throat> and finally, we have the CEO of Smart Africa. Uh, Smart Africa is really an organization, 24 member countries that are really driving the transformation agenda in Africa. Um, so we very much appreciate your role, both in public sector and in government. Um, let's start this conversation uh, with Benetta. Uh, <clears throat> given, given the importance of uh, the importance of digital identity and the importance of getting inclusion right, um, how do you see what are the barriers facing women and other marginalized communities? How can we get started on ways to develop this uh, identity systems in a way that are more inclusive? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I mean, um, I will talk about the African Union year of this year, 2019, of displaced returnees and refugees. You know, when I talk about uh, Agenda 2063, the Africa we want is an integrated Africa with one Africa, with one passport. Um, and I think that we are moving slowly there. But if I take the issue of refugee, I met recently a young girl who told me, 27 years I have been in Uganda <coughs> as a refugee, as a refugee without ide identity. Sometimes they are born in the place where they are for 27 years or 30 years. Do you have an identity? Can you enter into school? Can you exercise your right as a citizen? So those are 
the millions and millions of people we have in Africa which doesn't have any identity. Sometimes it's uh, maybe the UN. I invited one of the um, refugee young boys that was in WEF last year in Addis Ababa to talk to the president. And they said, I don't have an ID to come to Addis Ababa and talk to, your, to the people. So you had to do whatever is necessary to make sure that we access and we are able, maybe UNHCR will provide with some kind of, but do you feel part and parcel of that country that you are living? Can you access? Can you be an entrepreneur? Can you be what? You don't exist. So I think when you look at that, and I think this uh, digital uh, identity can help us very fast to make sure that we scale it up, you know, because if we just leave it to the government to do it, and it is needed because government have to take the lead, but private sector to accelerate millions of refugee displaced and so on are in, a, in our continent. So we need, it's a big market, let's say that. It's a very big market, and we need to make sure that government buy into it, but also the private sector are able to deliver. That's what the people, when you go to a refugee camp or a displaced camp, what they tell you. The other issue is land title. You know, it's a big issue, the, the land issues. Um, when you move, and it's still part of our big conflict, when you move from, um, let's give in the Sahel, or you leave from one country to move, and our borders are, um, you know, uh, very transparent. You sure. move from one place to another, you leave your land. 20 years back, you come, and you don't even know which, you know, to whom it belongs. It's your land, but you don't have any title within that land because you are not linked to it. So it, may, it has also to look into how the land issues, you know, the title of the land, the, your identity is also linked to all this. So in 20 years or 30 years back, you know that it belonged to your father or it belonged to me, but we need to look at those issues. And the WEF is looking into resilience, positive resilience, mm -hmm. not just, you know, resolving our conflict today, but looking into the, some of the root causes and building platform where we go move into solutions. So for me, this is one of the areas that we need to look at uh, this digital identity. And um, we are working with ECA, Economic Commission for Africa, uh, with Dr. Vera Songwe to make sure that do we bring private sector, public and private, to move this agenda forward. You know, we have seen the women demonstrating in this street. And um, you know, for South Africa, I think that we feel very sorry that this society that we know, Mandela, have been at the forefront of the struggle, but women are still suffering in these places. And certainly, when you have a child in this, not just in South Africa, do we register them? Do we go to the remote villages? Maybe it's happening here. But in many countries in Africa, the boys, the children, our newborn doesn't have an identity. I think you pointed a number of problems here that we should, uh, we should go into a little bit in more depth. In fact, uh, half of the global total that do not have identity are in Africa, and Africa about 500 exactly. million people, exactly. uh, which is about the half of the continent. So there's a long way to go. Yes. Um, and it is very much associated with empowering people. And we exactly. also know there is a gender gap. Uh, more, the, the gap is larger for women than in men. And uh, uh, that does link to their ability to access and formalize uh, land holding, with e going to business and services. But it's a good segue uh, for Lucina. Uh, she's outlined huge challenges. Uh, mm -hmm. What is Smart Africa doing to address and close some of those gaps that she's outlined? Thank you very much for having me. Uh, Smart Africa, as you know, a uh, uh, pan-African organization so where we have a private and public sector sitting on the board. Uh, I can see it's the first pan-African organization that, that has that has that, and we have a, we're putting together a flagship project called uh, 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 a blueprint for the digital ID, an integrated Pan-African digital ID. Why? 
is just to actually to be able to resolve some of these issues. When we look at Africa in general, uh, we see that uh, countries are on a different level. Rwanda, which is uh, a beacon country, have succeeded uh, the biometric identification for all the population. Then uh, private sector driven initiative uh, in terms of the KYC are relying on the authentication with the government. Perfect. Then when you go, but in Africa in general, or in Smart Africa, we look at the least common denominator, a country which does not even have a biometric uh, identification. Mm -hmm. It becomes an issue. We go, we look at the perspective, uh, when you are, uh, when you have a population, as a head of the state, you have uh, the responsibility to administer them. Mm -hmm. And uh, to administer them is basically the KYC, the C being know your citizens. And uh, we see that uh, in Africa, there are two tracks of uh, KYC. The private sector are moving forward. Mm. We've seen the example of the bank ID in Nigeria, uh, privately driven. And we have seen also that the mobile industry, they are actually moving forward with identifications, which are not, where there is no trust between the mobile MNOs, the mobile network operator and the government yet. So it's imperative for us to actually launch uh, a platform or initiative which will actually reconcile all these two tracks by giving to the government the control mm -hmm. of what is being identified in terms of KYC in the private sector mm -hmm. to be able to move on. But in parallel also, it does not mean that the government should stop doing the biometric identification like initiative launched by the World Bank like a moonshot and so on and so forth. But as they are moving up in terms of the number of identification of the populations, and they will catch up until the number of private KYC should be able to equal to public KYC. This is very important because when we talk about digital transformation, it is about putting the user or the citizen at the center, but not only the center. In the light of the CFTA, Continental Free Trade Agreement, it has to be an integrated citizen-centric approach because not only nationally, it is significant for you to know your customer, but your neighbor, who are you? Mm. It's very important because at the end of the day, when we look at the three pillars, policy environment, infrastructure, services, which can be public or private, private. it does not make any sense as long as the users are not identified because it's all about services to customer because that's the digital transformation. Fantastic. Okay, that's a great segue also. A you, you, couple of things we'll come back to uh, from what you, you, you putting the public-private partnership Absolutely. at the center and you're putting the citizen at the center. Um, I might add, maybe we think about resident as yeah. well because some, yeah. some, point, some people aren't citizens that should also be uh, addressed as uh, Benetta was saying. But that, that point you made, I think it was a good segue to Paula. In terms of citizen-centric ID, uh, what you've done in Rwanda is actually a great case in point and it'd be great to hear some of the lessons from what you've done with the Rembo and where you're thinking, where you're heading next with that program. Thank you. Um, and before maybe I talk about it, Rambo, it might be helpful to give a bit of context on what our journey has been as a country where we started with the very, the first generation of IDs uh, for the country uh, in making sure we have biometric identification for citizens that are of age, that is uh, 16 years and above, but also made provisions to uh, think about, you know, anyone that is less than 16 years, think about refugees and also think about foreign residents that are living into the country. And so our identification system, our national ID system caters for those different categories. And that was really uh, very essential when we talk about uh, you know, inclusion and making sure that we're not just capturing citizens, but looking at all the other segments of the society, people that are living within Rwanda that might not necessarily be of uh, Rwandan uh, nationality. And then um, the other provision that we made as we were designing our national ID uh, platform was to put in place the ability to have a smart ID. So it's a cheap best card. And so um, for, for many of the citizens that wanted to use the ID beyond uh, you know, means of identification and uh, registration and authentication, what else could they use it for? And so we started to think about the different um, use cases, whether we could integrate that with, uh, you know, your medical insurance uh, card, or whether you could integrate it with your driver's license details. And so having one card that serves multiple purposes was important that we have 
um, a system that allows us to also produce smart IDs for citizens that may want uh, to use the ID for more than just identification. And so we are at a point where we are now thinking about the digital ID platform for Rwanda. And uh, thanks to Smart Africa and the African Union that we've been working very closely with, the idea is that even as we think at a national level about identification, it's important that we're also thinking about cross-border mutual recognition. So how do we make it easy for a citizen in Rwanda when they're traveling, traveling anywhere across Africa to be able to use their ID? We've been able to achieve that for the East African region where I can use my ID card to travel to Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, but how do we take that beyond uh, just the region to the rest of the continent? And so those are some of the underlying standards and frameworks that we are now working to put in place so that as we, at a national level, as we all roll out our digital ID programs, at least we're doing it in a way that allows them to be interoperable at some point, but also to allow for this cross-border mutual recognition to happen. Uh, you talked about the Africa, uh, the CFTA, and that's very important. And for us, uh, in, what we're also looking at is how do we create a single digital market? And the digital ID becomes uh, you know, the best line or foundational platform that is really required to enable this uh, single digital market for Africa. And so these, uh, this is what our journey has been like. And so we're at that point where we're really working together with all these uh, multilateral organizations to put in place um, a very coordinated approach and framework that allows us the, to the point that when we start to implement our digital ID systems, we won't be uh, you know, reinvesting to, to make sure that they are interoperable with the other systems across uh, the continent. Um, back to your question about Irembo. Irembo is our you know, single platform where all our government services uh, are provided. And today we have about 97 government services online. Wow. And uh, one thing that we did, again, this brings in the aspect of inclusion, was to say not many of the Rwandans have smartphones. How do we make sure that when they're asking for a service online, they're still able to transact in that uh, platform? And so many, about 22 of those services, the common services that are used by citizens, especially citizens in the rural areas, have a USSD functionality. So that means that at least you are not obliging every citizen to have a smartphone, but also catering to what they have available to them, to the tools they have at their disposal, so that they're able to be part of this uh, um, you know, online service delivery effort that government is putting in place. The other thing um, that we also look at is to, it's also an opportunity to create jobs. Yep. Um, and so what we've done is putting in place a 4,000 agency network across the country. So you have agents across the country that are able to provide citizens to, uh, with services in, without them having to travel you know, long distances to go to a government office to get a service. And that's very important. But um, in doing that, and, and we have a very interesting way of looking at it, because what used to happen back in the days, it took you about four to five trips. To, to get a service from government. You, you have the very first trip where you're just trying to understand what are the requirements of getting this service. Then you have the next trip where you're actually doing the submissions. And you probably have two more trips where you're just checking in on where is my service, is my birth certificate ready for pickup? And then maybe the last trip, which is really to get your service and your certificate. And so that had to be cut down to at least one trip. And the intention for the government is that there's no trip at all. So we call it zero trip, zero paper. How do we make sure that in the comfort of your home, in your garden, wherever you are at work, you're able to apply for a government service and receive it without having to walk any distance? And, 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 that has, and, and many of the services you still are able to at least go there once, but at least you get notifications on the status of the service that you've requested for, and you're told when to come in to pick your service. And so you're just making one trip as opposed to the four to five trips that uh, one had to make. And so we did calculations and realized that bringing it from four to five trips to exactly one trip or no trip at all is saving you about 68 human years. Wow. Because you sit in offices pretty much three to four hours waiting to even meet someone who's going to tell you for X service you need a birth certificate, you need your ID, you need this and that. And so that is really time wasted that you could be using to do other things that are very uh, productive. And um, so that, that is where we are in terms of uh, really all these 97 services being able, they're very, they're available 24-7. We have, um, you know, contact center where citizens are able to call in if they have any issues, they're able to be resolved within real time. 
So, and, and then very specifically linking to the ID, beyond simply uh, identification, we're able to use this, uh, your ID number as a means to authenticate you as a citizen when you're requesting for a service. But the other thing that we're doing, and this is a very interesting discussion that has happened within government, is to say things like a birth certificate, a marriage certificate, it's really identification information. Should it be a service that government is providing? Is there information that resides in a government institution, and why should that be requested of a citizen to provide as proof? So basically, how do you make sure that all systems across government are integrated so that I'm not asking a citizen to, uh, to get me a birth certificate that local government authorities will provide, but rather my system plugs into the local government databases and is able to pull that information, and then we cut down on all those uh, requirements that we have to give citizens. Wow. And uh, the last point um, that I wanted to make, which is also very important, and this comes to the uh, KYC concept, is that it, you need credible data, accurate data. And so it's not just the digital ID or you know, the front end systems that we deal with as citizens, it's also the back end systems. How are we um, you know, automating all these back end uh, systems so that as a citizen you have minimum information to populate into a form. That way the, the data is authentic and accurate enough to facilitate the process of you know, knowing your citizen and knowing your customer. And so that's what our journey has been as Rwanda. Excellent. That's, uh, you mentioned the Africa we want, Africa 2063. When I hear you, when I hear the kinds of things that you're doing, when 97 services are available online and you're really focusing on stripping out the inefficiencies, um, I think whether we're African or European or American, uh, that's the world we want. So. <laughs> Very much appreciate what you're doing uh, and, and uh, understand why um, the importance of the Rwandan example for us. But you, you mentioned so many things that raised for me both uh, interest and potential concerns. Um, and Margaret, I'd ask you to come in on some of these points. When you have so, many, so much information flow between the citizens and government and potentially across government agencies, it seems that that calls for some safeguards because there are some potential risks that may happen when those flows may not be very well uh, governed. I'm not speaking in the Rwanda case, but in such a general, general point. Right. Um, and also, how do you get citizens you know, to be able to interact with such systems? What does it take in terms of bringing people into this? Well, and I'll tell you, at uh, Dell Technologies, um, we uh, build a lot of infrastructure for secure identities and uh, data infrastructure. And what we see, and we've touched on it a little bit here, but there's four main barriers that we see to really capitalizing on digital identities for, um, for Africa. The first one is educating end users about the benefits of having a secure identity. Right. The second one is really the public-private uh, partnership. The third one is um, country collaboration in order to be able to facilitate the use case that you talked about, about cross-border moving. And the final one, and this is probably the most critical one, where Dell Technologies puts a lot of investment, is being able to provide secure infrastructure. And when you think about the notion of secure infrastructure, it starts with a um, certified supply chain for products that are intrinsically secure, along with software and ecosystem that's secure above that. And then once you've done the work around technology, people, and process, educated end users, then you can have a system that can work well, well together. And that's really what Dell Technologies is focused on. Dell is a uh, um, family of um, seven strategically aligned family of businesses, which all provide very, very different capabilities to be able to provide that basic <coughs> intrinsic secure infrastructure, as well as the um, software and data management to capitalize the value out of the data. And then when you think about the public and private partnership, um, and, and it touches on what uh, you talked about, if you look at private in institutions, the business case for private institutions is absolutely there. To be able to have a trusted buyer and vendor relationship, that will grow GDP, that will be able to help enable the basic human right of identities within, uh, within the region. Great, great. Um, have, have you done work to educate users or um, 
work on data protection issues as well? Yeah, absolutely. So the the EU launched um, GDPR, General Data Protection Regulation, about two years ago. And one of the big projects that we did in the UK, along with the UK government, is actually partnered with many other big companies to educate end users about their basic rights, that every individual has the right to be forgotten if they want to. Right. And that that's what the GDPR, it's a good thing. And uh, we're actually very, um, uh, we actually believe that GDPR, that privacy, it's part of what a brand needs to do to be able to develop a, um, a connected relationship with end users. And I see that as something much, much more important as we move forward in the fourth digital re revolution. Absolutely. Uh, you mentioned a couple of things on the trust and privacy, and I'm glad to see companies coming together to, to uh, educate users, or in your case, we talked about KYC, but you used a different term, not know your customer, but know your citizen. Absolutely. <coughs> so the, the public sector version of KYC. Um, trust is so important. Um, without trust, you're not gonna get the high levels of utilization of these systems. When you don't get those high levels of utilization, you don't get the efficiency gains. When you don't get full inclusion, having to address the, the barriers to the access that women and marginalized communities face, um, then the efficiency gains, the Africa we want, the digital common market we want will not happen. How do we build trust? To build the trust because you have to realize that uh, the most of the country in Africa, which is their right, the government do not trust the private sector in general in terms of identification because the government think uh, it is their role uh, to determine who is entitled to be that person or to produce the paper to say this is the person. Here is what has been happening for the past 10 years. With the mobile industry, there was an explosion. Suddenly, most of the country started asking the MNOs to, they passed a decree asking the uh, the MNO to identify the users. In these identifications, they made the KYC in terms of know your customer. Normally, those KYC are based and authenticated on the government data. But it happened that most of the country, that data is not ready because not everyone is identified biometrically. That's why you see in some, some country there are 25 million population. There are 34 million subscribers of uh, cell phone. And there are only 8 million registered with the bio. How do you deal with that? 8 million subscribed with the bio. Government don't trust the KYC done by the private sector. The basic foundation to build that trust is to give the government control to certify who is, who is a really identifiable or who is a really a citizen or this information is a, a genuine information. How to do that is it through a public-private partnership such as concession. You put together a platform, a concession run by a government agency. They will run through all the mobile subscribers, people who have a genuine ID biometric, for example, in this scenario, it will be called mobile ID. That agency is responsible to say, this is you, Mr. Magdi. That's your phone number. I see you. I certify. Please enter your PIN number private. That runs into the government system to know the identification that you have. It is a real identification. While the, in parallel, government is running its own biometric. Right. That way, the government start trusting the private sector. So with that identification, when we talk about service, I said it's all about three things. Policy environment, infrastructure, services. Service. Like in Rwanda, the government rolled out 97 services. Either you call, or you walk in, or you browse. For social inclusiveness in Rwanda, is just USSD. So when you call, my grandmother calls, she can't do USSD. Mm -hmm. Who are you, madam? This is my name. What's your phone number? 
phone number is tagged into the identification. Enter your PIN number, PIN number, boom. Mm -hmm. That's how you reconcile the trust between the private-driven identification mm -hmm. and the public-driven identification. Mm -hmm. And they both can run apart. There will be a certain point they will converge. Mm -hmm. Then you will see a number of mobile subscribers equal to the number of the people who are identified. And the key is the transparency between the two and ah. to be able to do that in a trusted manner. Yep. Exactly. So transparency is a key. In terms of building trust, we see uh, a lot of governments around Africa and around the world putting identity systems forward and the processes are important. Um, how do you bring citizens into the process? How do you hear from you know, an active civil society about what the potential harms and risks? Yeah. But how do you get the inclusion right? I think that the um, example of Rwanda is quite, uh, you know, exemplary and the need to be shared because you will see the benefit of, uh, you know, identifying your people and making sure that uh, they are part and parcel. It's not just about election because, you know, uh, the elephant in the room is um, elections in Africa that control, you know, that I... These people are going to vote for me, you know, bringing all the other issues around it. But we need to show the benefit of it, because by having the, the identifying your people, your citizens, you are able also to identify, you know, the investment that you need to put on your people when it comes to, um, you know, education, when it comes to your, you know, in each remote areas. And this is what Rwanda and other good places are doing. So you need to make sure that you know the numbers. As you say, sometimes we just have one third of the population. So how can you measure? How you a development plan to address some of the critical issue for your people? So you need uh, we need to show to the African context that right. you know it's good to know um, your citizen and what are the needs of your citizen. So it's a benefit. So Rwanda is a good case. Um, and when you look at uh, even within the, we were talking about just before coming here, on the economy. You know, now we see that uh, it's so important to have this, this card, you know, um, that where you can visa card or whatever card that you can take your money or having in your mobile phone. Right. And you can access it in a rural area. You don't need to travel and to go to Kigali and go to your bank. You can access your account, you can access money, you can, you know, so that digital um, access um, to financing is also critical uh, to, the, to, to, the, to the women that are in the village. Yes. So I think it's important that we look at all the benefits that um, identity can bring and the digital identity in, uh, for the people of this continent, and in particular the women and the young people. Absolutely, so you're bringing in the financial inclusion question and your, your model on essentially putting government trust frameworks in place that allow public-private participation in, in authentication. Uh, I think the financial sector is one of the most important ones because yeah. if uh, ID systems are in place, the KYC process, which is so costly, yes. and if it's costly to do KYC, particularly for people who don't have documentation, yes. They're not going to have inclusion. You're not going to get financial inclusion in, for exactly. rural women. So I think your point is very valid, and we should think about also harmonizing that across, across Africa, because if it's a digital common market, we can't all have different processes. It's true, but it's very important to point out. If you look at the 55 country in Africa, uh, some opportunity been missed by some country which is a human capital development. Yep. That's what Rwanda actually grabbed. Mm. The human capital development to understand that for me to be, to go from point A to point B, which is a knowledge-based economy, I need to know my people. Mm. But what you see in Africa, it is not, there's certainly an exception. Countries that have a natural resources, they tend to be lagging in terms of human capital development. Rwanda knows that the only thing they have is their people. And let's focus on them and identify them. These are our resources. And that resource is infinite. Mm -hmm. So it's very important. Yeah. And the Rwanda, the, Rwanda is a classical case. Now they are at the point to build a digital 
ID interoperable with the neighbors. Countries which are still trailing, what they need to know, they need to consolidate the asset of the success made by the telco and to build a trust platform through a partnership, a public private partnership to be able to move on. But the government need to think about the human capital development to drive the cost down of identification of a young girl who is maybe five or 10 or seven years old in a village which has not even a birth certificate. That's right. She has a potential. Mm -hmm. yep. Yep. I mean, I wanted to come in on the, on the issue, the question you raised around trust and I like what you said about education and sensitization because that's very important. And, and I want to marry this with the idea of public-private partnerships and maybe we need to change that and call it people, private and, you know, public because at the end of the day, if you're talking about a very citizen-centric approach, right. where sure. are the people in this? Well, how is their voice heard? And I think yeah. part of doing education and sensitization is really to understand what are their concerns and how do we build in safeguards as we design these digital ID systems to respond and, and address some of these concerns that they have. Um, and we also talked about systems. Uh, I believe for many of the governments as they build their digital ID systems, they're t thinking about the PKI systems that bring in an element of, of, of security. But something that I find that's very important on top of that, as well as the data privacy and protection policies and regulations that we have, is something you call privacy by design. Okay. And I think we have countries that have been very successful at that, like Estonia, where you have all your data out there, but you also know who is looking at your data, and you can question why they're looking at your data. Mm -hmm. So how do we, the, the whole approach about being citizen-centric is also that citizens should be able to own their data. Right. How do we build that into the systems that as a citizen, I own this data, but I also know who is looking at my data and what they're using it for. And I think that's one of the ways that we can start looking at to say, how do we respond to these privacy concerns uh, that people may have so that you build trust across the board and people know that you're doing it to improve uh, service delivery as, as opposed to using the data for something else. And, and so these are some of the aspects that will come out from you know, a multi-stakeholder dialogue that allows not just the private sector and governments to think for the citizens, but also let's have the citizens, let's have right. their voice, let's understand right. what their concerns are, yeah. and let's get ideas on how to, you know, to, to go around this privacy um, concerns that they may have. I love that. I love that. Uh, the, all the points you made in terms of having an inclusive, open, multi-stakeholder dialogue. Uh, my colleague Thea, I think, is in the room. She works hard on getting civil society engaged and also data protection authorities uh, involved. I really like what you also have said about uh, four Ps, right? People, uh, public, uh, private partnerships. Um, and, and, and how do we bridge that? I want to go around the, the table and ask, in terms of use cases, what are the highest priority use cases where we might be able to coalesce some of these ideas? Um, you know, I, I, before doing that, I just while you're thinking about that, I just wanted to reflect on your point, Vanetta. Um, we talk a lot about inclusion, uh, but when people think about ID, we often find them excluding those marginalized populations because they're not citizens, which is ironic because the only way to really you know, some of those concerns usually come from a security standpoint. Yeah. But how do you get security when you're excluding people? Um, it's really, that causes insecurity rather than security. So I, I find that ironic that we're not taking the view that Rwanda is taking, give everybody ID uh, and have that open conversation. So I ask, what are the, what's the priority use cases we should focus on uh, to put this on the table in a concrete way that people actually feel the benefits? Well, I'll tell you, the one that I'm particularly um, passionate about is really this notion of privacy and the fact that uh, the digital identity is the ownership of the individual. Right. <clears throat> and it's the government's role as well as private institutions' role to safeguard that for the individual. So um, I know in the private agenda, um, customer privacy, customer data privacy is absolutely something that is paramount because without that trust, um, a lot of the benefits from um, identity management and identity transparency go, go away. So that's, that's probably one use case that I'm particularly passionate it's about. Privacy. Yeah, okay. privacy. Fantastic. <coughs> yeah, you see, the privacy issue is a very big issue right now. Africa is the only continent which does not have a GDPR-like law, 
right? Right. Okay. I want to be a bit. I want to be a little bit bold here. During the colonization time, African countries are the biggest exporter of the product, right? Raw material. Ship it out, repackage it, sell it back. What is the difference between that and what is happening today in terms of data privacy? We have no privacy law. Everyone access to, everyone has access to African data. They took it up, repackage it, sell it back to us. Same thing. So as long as we don't come together and have a data governance law, a privacy law, who gets to see our data? I like the fact that we have a BPPP. I know who's looking at my data. So when you sell it back to me, I know. It is a reality, and that's what we are doing, you know, initiative. African data have to stay on the continent, even if the cloud, if it's on the cloud, the cloud has to be in the continent. Mm -hmm. That so, is the reality. So both, both people in control of their data and Africa in control, in of, control of it, in terms absolutely. of governance of, of data. So yes. um, back to the privacy, but also right. building the institutions. Yes. Most important yes. use case. Most of our insecurity in this continent is due to the lack of not taking into consideration the people's need and the people's priorities. And I think that if we need to address, we need to put the citizen at the middle right. in our response in terms of security. Um, and I think that uh, when we look at Agenda 2063, Africa we want is the women and the youth. And, but you need to identify them. But um, I like the idea of investing on the people, investing on the youth, investing on the women. Um, either it is in the agriculture, you go down, just uh, Rwanda, you go down to the, uh, the countryside, we have huge land. Um, we make sure that the young people who are very much interested in this can go by using innovative way and responding to them. This is about security. Indeed. It's not Indeed. the military security that we think. It's more investing on the people. And investing is a human capital. Mm -hmm. and, uh, which, that which then leads to physical security. Exactly. Right. So for us, I think it's, uh, you mentioned it, education, we mentioned the fact the economic empowerment of this. But it starts with this identity. Okay. It starts to be a citizen. It starts to, to be I'm part of this society, and I can contribute to that. So our government have to understand that and make sure that we give that as a priority, the human development. This is first our capital. This is our assets. And that's what we need to focus, okay. um, um, public, private. And I do agree that. You know, the people should be part of that platform. Excellent. Paula, the floor is yours. Thank you. I'll be brief. So for me, what I'm looking at is more social protection programs. And for a case like ours where a lot of these programs are very targeted to how we, um, you know, we segment or categorize households and their ability to have access uh, to some of the basic services, education, healthcare, and it but also the ability to leverage this digital ID in a way that allows for graduation because it's one thing to design it for social protection programs, but how do you allow for people to graduate and have better lives and even move into the next level? And so th that's where I feel like uh, th there's a lot of potential there um, and a lot of potential to, to really boost the social innovations that are you know, leveraging you know, this data set to, to provide targeted services and targeted innovations that respond to those challenges. Fantastic. So social protection, I'm going to put financial inclusion in there as well. I would agree with that. Um, I, I very much appreciate the platform of privacy and public-private people. People, people, people partnerships. Yeah. Um, putting people at the center because it's about human capital, okay. uh, human dignity, and empowering people, not necessarily empowering uh, governments more than they're already empowered, but how do you lift people up to also be empowered and to address the problems we all face? When you look at Ethiopia, just to mention, when it comes back to the first the conversation, we started to make sure that there is uh, identity for refugee and displaced. Ethiopia have started 
why not other countries as well? Why not every, every country? And let me just round back to the, where we started. The question of empowering women, it's not only in South Africa. Yeah. It's everywhere. And yeah. gender-based violence is everywhere. Exactly. In every class, every race. Exactly. Um, we all need to face it. And we all need to work on it. And uh, well, first of all, just uh, uh, finally, thank you all for a good conversation. Thank you. Thank you. That is indeed the Africa we want. Um, so thank you all for helping shape it. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.